Hello, welcome to this episode of Learn Kubernetes with Google. I'm Cynthia Thomas, and I'm part of the Kubernetes networking team. We're starting a mini series on how to manage IPs in Kubernetes and how dual stack networking can help make your Kubernetes deployments easier. Today, I'll talk about some of the common challenges with IPv4 and how IPv6 can help. What does dual stack networking mean anyhow? It means your applications can be supported by both IPv4 and IPv6 address families. Some common problems that users have faced with IPv4 are fragmentation and exhaustion. While applications have modernized to a microservices architecture, these issues are good reasons to move to a modernized networking scheme. In Kubernetes, pods are treated as first-class citizens and each get an IP. Here's an example of creating a cluster where three IPv4 ranges are required for assigning to nodes, pods, and services. For clusters scaling to hundreds or thousands of nodes and pods, the IPv4 requirements for a Kubernetes cluster can be quite demanding. For example, assume you want to create a 100 node cluster with room to scale and have services. You would need a slash 24 for the node cider. Let's say you're accounting for the number of pods to be 20 on each node. The number of IPs looks like 2,000 are required, but accounting for growth, IP availability, and contiguous CIDR blocks, the impact means you need to claim a slash 19 for your cluster CIDR. That can be challenging for admins to assign for multiple clusters in IP fragmented environment. Some users have to do a careful dance to insert their Kubernetes clusters in order to connect to non-containerized workloads, hybrid, and multi-cloud environments. They're already dealing with existing IP before address assignments. These are typically fragmented in nature and for historical and operational reasons. Even though Kubernetes clusters can scale to thousands of nodes, being able to support a large number of pods may lead to some limitations or advanced IP management to fit into an operator's existing environment. Some providers have advanced features to help with management like tuning pod density per node and allowing discontinuous CIDR blocks to help work around IPv4 limitations. In this example, we can use GKE's default max pods per node parameter to fine tune our cluster's pod density per node. Another advanced GKE feature that helps alleviate large contiguous blocks is adding a new range for pods via a new node pool. This is otherwise known as adding a discontinuous multi-pod CIDR block. Moving to dual stack clusters means that users can open up an entire new IP allocation scheme with future-proof capacity and overcome existing fragmentation issues with a transition plan. Another aspect that has accelerated IPv6 adoption is the IPv4 exhaustion issue. Around the world, several jurisdictions have completely run out of IPv4 addresses, and the remaining ones have skyrocketed in price. IPv6 adoption has grown tremendously in various geographies and in industries such as telco, gaming, IoT, and crypto. With dual stack networking in Kubernetes, we're now able to ensure IPv6 communication is working as intended. This helps users migrate to IPv6. While dual stack clusters don't save on IPv4 addresses directly, they do help users architect differently in the migration to IPv6. They also help users to test applications for IPv6 compatibility before adoption. Finally, dual stack clusters allow workloads to reach IPv6 endpoints on the internet. For those of us in the networking industry, we've been talking about IPv6 for decades. With dual stack networking in Kubernetes, users can now make the leap to IPv6 without cutting off v4 only services. We're at an exciting point in the IPv6 journey where users can finally move to an IPv6 application stack. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more details on dual stack clusters in this series.